and uh, and welcome to uh, those members of the of the uh, of the mailing list who haven't been to any of these talks so far. Um, it's great to have you here, and we will uh, record this meeting. So. Um, if you have to dash off or if you miss any of it, um, it'll be available afterwards, um, either on uh, YouTube or if you want to get more involved and uh, have access to our um, Slack workspace, then um, you can apply to join as a sort of full member um, and then you can join discussions that happen afterwards as well. So today's talk is by Liz Thomas from the British Antarctic Survey. And um, thanks very much, Liz, for agreeing to give the talk. Uh, Liz um, works on, on ice cores and, and um, looking at climate records from ice core and paleo data. And, um, you know, we've had a long um, period of working on climate variability and other aspects, looking at the atmosphere and how it how we can extract information from that from my score. So it's it's always great to find out what, what's been happening and get an update on Liz's work. And she'll be talking on behalf of the Clivash 2K, 2K group, which she, she may give more information about. So I'll, without further ado, I'll welcome Liz to begin her talk. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Um, well, hello everybody, um, and yeah, so as Tom says, I'm going to give this talk, and it's it's really a, a bit of a review about some of the work that I've been involved with, but I'm also presenting work from quite a few other people that have been involved in two of the working groups that um, I've been kind of heavily involved in. One is the, is the Clivash 2K, and so this is a pages um, sponsored project. Um, and the other is also one of the other SCAR working groups. So um, this is the instant working group and particularly, so I, I co-lead theme one um, and within that there's a, a project about proxies and processes. So a lot of the work that's sort of been here really overlaps between sort of the three different groups, if you like, um, and particularly as well with the Anklin now. So it's sort of quite nice to see how we can link these and bring them all together. Um, so I just kind of wanted to start off some of this is so just give an overview of, of my title really, which sounds a bit silly, but um, I'm going to start off by giving a bit of a review and an overview about the snowfall changes. So this is some of the work that we've done reconstructing um, surface mass balance from ice falls. This is a snowfall part. And then really the, the sort of interest is um, what's driving the variability in surface mass balance. And there's a, a huge range of things that we can talk about, but one of them I'm really going to focus on is the sea ice element of this. And then the salty snow comes in because um, I want to just give a, a quick introduction to a project I'm working on at the moment, which is trying to compile um, all the available sodium and sulfate data from Antarctic ice cores. So that's the, the salty snow part. So just as a very sort of overview, hopefully most people are familiar with this, um, but I'm aware that some of you may not be, but back in 2017, um, I was involved in a project and I compiled all of the available um, snow accumulation records that we had from ice cores at the time. So we compiled 79 um, different ice core records, which you can just see on the plot here in the sort of yellow crosses. Um, and really what we did from this study, it came from a background where um, in some ways the importance of surface mass balance and snowfall had been perhaps not, um, not fully explored. So there'd been obviously a lot of work going on to say that Antarctica had been losing mass. So we've had melt and the satellite observations had shown that quite strongly. However, there had been a bit of an assumption that actually the snowfall and the surface mass balance element of this um, equation had been relatively stable. And what we were able to do in this study is really demonstrate that that's actually not true. And that um, when looked at as a whole, so across the whole of the Antarctic ice sheet, there's actually been a sort of significant increase in snowfall for the last 200 years, particularly during the latter part of the 20th century. So here I'm just showing the, the trends in total Antarctic snowfall, so in two different ways really. So on the left we've got this showing as a, a histogram. So this is presenting the 50 year and the 100 year trends since 1800. And what we're showing on top of there really is just that the, the solid line is highlighting the most recent 50 year trend and the, and the dashed um, vertical line is showing the most recent 100 year trend and really showing on this histogram how they're, they're pretty much right on the outside of, of what's expected in terms of the range of natural variability. 
And then we're also just showing this in a different way. So in the, um, in the map of Antarctica here, this was part of a collaboration I did with Britt Medley, where she actually took all of the ice core data and then mapped it effectively onto the, the reanalysis grids um, so that we can then start to look at the spatial variability. And so this is showing the, the trends in the last 100 years. And really, it kind of brings out the, the different region, regional um, patterns that we're seeing. So that's kind of an, an introduction, really, as to what, what we produced and then sort of the significance of this is why is it so important is that actually when we started looking at these numbers um, and how much snowfall have been changing, we realized that, you know, actually there's been having a significant impact. And, and in fact, since um, 1800, the amount of snowfall has increased in the order of 272 billion tons, which is quite a big number. And when you actually convert that into sea level equivalent, we can say that actually during the 20th century, this increase in snowfall, so snow that then fell on Antarctica, actually acted to mitigate um, global sea levels during the 20th century by as much as 10 millimetres. So, I mean, clearly this is um, a very important process. I've just put the numbers in here just as a comparison for the, the um, estimated mass loss. So you can see that actually, you know, what the mass gains are in no way keeping up with the mass losses. So we're still in, in a negative balance, but they're still pretty significant. And it still shows that in orders for us to um, predict future changes in sea level, it's important that we don't just focus on how Antarctica is losing mass, but also how Antarctica is potentially gaining mass. And one of the key things for this really is that in a future world, in a warming world, we expect that Antarctica will start to increase um, there will be more snowfall. And so it's important that we understand these processes. So kind of getting on to, to then why this is interesting and the bits that I'm really interested in at the moment is what are the drivers of this variability? So in, on the one hand, what's driving this sort of total increase? And then on the other, what, what are the, what's, um, how can we explain these big spatial um, differences, the spatial variability? And I've just um, borrowed a, a figure here from Florence uh, Florence Carlioni's recent um, publication, where it's really kind of showing how complex some of these processes are, but just sort of a schematic to show some of the different things. So they include a variety of different changes in oceanic conditions, so such as upwelling, changes in the circulation, um, and also the changes in the heat flux, which are also then dependent on the amount of sea ice cover. So these processes um, are happening in the ocean, will have a big impact not only on um, the surface mass balance on the snowfall, but also on the processes that are driving the melting from the edges as well, that are changing um, the sort of contribution to sea level. And then in the atmosphere, we've got these um, changes in the wind strength, where we've got strengthening of westerlies, where we've got the position or location of the easterlies has a big impact on the sort of oceanic changes. And obviously these things in themselves, these changes in the atmospheric conditions, are then linked to, to larger scale patterns, so larger modes of variability, um, but also tropical teleconnection. So the importance of SAM, ENDO, IPO. So I think the kind of picture really is that it's a fairly complex thing that's going on um, and we want to really try and pull these things apart. So the first area of this was looking at these um, spatial reconstructions. So this is again going back to the work that I did with Brooke. Um, where we were looking at the different regional variability. And so even just looking at these, you're able to sort of start to form hypothesis about, you know, why is it that we've got this different variability in certain areas of the map? So I'm just sort of drawing on this relationship that we see in West Antarctica. So the, the very blue area of the map in, in the figure A here um, is showing a big increase in snowfall in the Antarctic Peninsula. So we know this. But then what we've also got is this big red area, which is showing a decrease in snowfall in, um, in West Antarctica River, sort of closer to the Ross Ice Shelf. And so this sort of dipole pattern is well documented, not only in the snowfall, but also in temperatures and sea, and sea ice. And this is really reflecting this um, very dominant mode of um, atmospheric variability, this, this deepening low pressure over the Amundsen Sea or the Amundsen Sea Low. So this sort of first um, allows us to, to look at some of these different um, different uh, atmospheric variability that's going on. And in fact, this, this strong relationship with um, atmospheric circulation, particularly the um, Amundsen Sea Low, is obviously um, related and driven strongly by changes in the southern annular mode. And what we're showing here in this figure is that actually the pattern that we see, this pattern of variability during the last 100 years, and then in, in the figure B is just focusing on the last 50 years, this looks very much like um, the pattern you would expect if we were just um, imprinting the southern annular mode onto the onto precipitation. So these two figures in between B and C look very similar. And in fact, the, what we concluded from this paper is that actually 80% of the variability that we see across Antarctica can be explained by changes in the southern annular mode. 
However, the interesting thing is that actually, if it was just SAM that was, you know, SAM is driving the variability in the pattern, but it's not actually responsible for the increase. So what we're left with, if we take away the SAM part, is a more homogeneous picture. So this figure in plot D is actually when we've taken away the SAM, and this is what we're left with. And what you see is rather than this kind of, um, you know, different um, areas of red and blue on, on the picture, we're looking like it, a more homogeneous kind of increase in snowfall. This is a sort of background increase. And it's this part that we termed the residual. And this, um, the amount of snowfall that we're seeing is actually can be explained relatively well as an increase in temperature. So just very simply, um, a warmer atmosphere is a wetter atmosphere. And so this increase reflects changes in temperature. And then moving on from this, I've um, been fortunate to do um, some work with um, a really good group in, um, in Brussels. And so, not in Brussels, sorry, in um, <laughs> Belgium. Uh, and so this is the work from Quentin Daladin that I'm presenting here. And this is where he used the, um, a data assimilation approach, really to try and compare what we're seeing from the ice cores um, with what the global circulation models, the UCMs, are actually telling us. And so what they found in this, in this new kind of data assimilation approach is that, in fact, the temperature reconstructions, which are shown here um, in the red, are actually, if you, if you base those temperature reconstructions on surface mass balance from ice cores, you actually and often get a, a higher um, or closer relationship to the temperature than you would if you were using a more traditional temperature proxy, which is the um, stable water isotopes. So what we're showing here is that actually the, the surface mass balance or the snow accumulation records is um, looking very similar to the um, reconstructions that you would get from the global circulation models and also from other um, reconstructions here. So I'm showing the Nichols and Bromwich one and the, um, the Steny reconstruction, which was based on ice core and um, stable water isotopes. So it's clear that actually temperature is playing quite a big role. However, it's not the only thing by, by a long way. And so this is just showing some other examples and there's quite a lot of gone on. So I've just sort of cherry picked a few things, but just an example here of some of the work that Jan Lennitz did. Um, we're actually this, this pattern of variability again, where we said it looked very like the SAM, is also can be explained as a, as a relationship to ozone. So not surprisingly, I guess, given that ozone and the relationship with changes in, in the winds as well. So there's other um, sort of attribution studies, if you like, that have been ongoing to try and explain this pattern. And then one of the other things that um, others, many, many different groups have been looking at is actually this relationship between um, linking the changes in surface mass balance and changes in sea ice. So it's very easy to kind of think that um, the sea ice acts as a barrier to the, the ocean. And when you remove that, it then um, allows you, you know, more availability of the surface level moisture that then results in more snowfall and the coast adjacent to it. Um, and so there's obviously clearly a very good, a very strong link with here. But some of the difficult things that we have is that it's difficult to disentangle changes in sea ice from changes in, um, for example, that the ozone or the SAM um, or changes in temperature, because they're all interlinked in some way. So some of the things that I think are quite important in sort of where we should be going is trying to establish the, the drivers of this variability, because clearly um, surface mass balance is important. And if we want to be looking at future predictions, we really need to understand these processes. And it's about trying to, to disentangle um, what's going on. And this, I think, is actually relatively difficult to do within the short observational period that we have, because it's hard to really, um, there's simply a, the record isn't long enough to take out the periods of ENSO or, or looking at different phases of the SAM, for example. And also the period is too short to look at the natural variability. So it's important not only to, to focus on what's been happening under a forced world, under an anthropogenic world, but actually what was happening before that, you know, what's the natural variability and what's the real baseline? And some of the work that um, Tom and others have done, especially is, is shown really how the importance of this baseline, this, you know, what do you put in as the baseline value for, for things like sea ice and winds um, is really, you know, those initial conditions are really important for um, future predictions. So clearly sea ice is in, important. And so this kind of leads on to another, you know, following on from that, another study is, you know, do we have enough um, records or reconstructions of sea ice that we can start to address some of these changes? So again, in another review back in 2019, pulled together all the different um, published records and actually found 92 published records that um, have been used to reconstruct sea ice during at least part of the last 2000 years. And so 75 sites of those are actually in the marine realm. So these are you know, sediment records and actually 17 are from ice cores. 
And between them, between the ice cores and the marine, we utilize a whole range of different proxies. So we're not just focusing on a single thing, but we're combining maybe the geochemistry, isotopes, and in the case of the, um, of the ice cores, looking at snow accumulation, and then also the organic compounds and diatoms. But despite the sort of relatively high number of records, you can actually see on the map, some of the figures are a little bit small there, but the very the, um, sort of spatial coverage is pretty poor. Um, and at the moment, we just you know, have large areas and sectors that we just have um, you know, no data available from. So despite this, and you know, kind of acknowledging that we've got relatively little data, what we could do with the ice cores is try to calibrate the data against the satellite observations and try and look and see if we can at least capture the trends during the 20th century. And so you can see that here, just showing on the, on the plot on, so the plot on the left is the reconstructions from the ice cores. And the, and the plot B here is showing the same pattern, but um, what we'd be seeing from um, the satellite observations. And just looking at these across very big sectors, and so not looking at the small scale, but just kind of by sector. And what we can see is that, for example, the ice core reconstructions, um, particularly in something like the Ross Sea, um, we can see that we've got multiple records that show this sort of expanse during the, the, um, that we see during the observational period since 79 is actually part of a 100 a year trend. So we can see this is being picked up consistently in the, um, the paleo reconstructions. And likewise, in the Bellingshausen Sea, we've got this um, decline in sea ice, which we see very strongly during the satellite era. And it appears that it's actually part of a 100 year trend. But obviously, the data I just showed you is very crude. <laughs> um, there's you know, huge data gaps within there. And, and it's not really getting down to understanding the processes, which is what we really want to do. So this is again where the, the global circulation models really come into this because they can take advantage of, um, you know, use this relatively limited observation on paleo data, but provide a more spatially complete reconstruction. So again, this is an, another study in here where we combined um, the snow accumulation and stable water isotopes from ice cores together with um, the records from the mid-latitudes from tree rings. Um, and these have been combined then with the physics of the climate models using a data assimilation approach that we showed earlier from the uh, Quentin Valadin. And the result is that we can then produce these sea ice reconstructions back through time for different sectors and actually provide more spatially complete reconstructions. And I'm just showing an example here of these um, reconstructions from two different sectors um, to demonstrate how well they compare with um, existing reconstructions, but independent reconstructions. So the site's still from ice cores, but the two records here are showing ice core reconstructions in the black um, using the chemistry, so using MSA in this, these particular examples, and then how they compare so well with the other reconstructions, which are using a completely different and completely independent um, set of data. So I'm also aware that there's been some other reconstructions on sea ice, which I would strongly encourage people to go and look at, so particularly Ryan Fote's paper, which is out at the moment, um, presenting another um, slightly different approach to reconstruction sea ice. So there's other things going on. But rather than focus on that, because I think we should be getting Ryan to talk about his own work, um, I'm just going to um, stick a bit more on, on this particular study that I was involved with. So just returning to the, the, um, the Quentin study here, I'm showing this plot, and it's quite a lot on, a, on the slide there, so I do apologize. Um, and I really do encourage you to kind of go and look at the actual original papers, because there's a lot of information in here. But I just want to um, highlight a few things that I think are particularly interesting for, for the work that we're doing and for, for some of the work that um, I'm going to be involved in. So the, the figure here is showing um, we've got the linear trends in geopotential height temperatures, um, snow accumulation, and sea ice cover over the last 200 years, but they've been separated into these um, time slices, these 50-year time intervals. Um, and some of the things that this, um, this new data assimilation approach brings out is things that we, um, we've already been relatively well documented. So if we focus on the um, plots over to the far uh, right, um, we can see what's happening in the last 50 years. And so, for example, we've got here, things here, um, you know, this strong warming over West Antarctica and the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, and we've also got this um, deepening of the Amundsen Sea Low shown in the, in the top plot here as these sort of dark, these um, green areas. Um, and then we've got the, the changes in sea ice. So these are all things that are relatively well documented. But what I think is important in this, um, you know, these and what the advantage of these kind of data assimilation approaches is that we're able to put all of these different parameters together in one way and actually look at the different way in the relationships between them and how they varied through time. And I think one of the things that's really important for me is that it really highlights that 
if we just looked at those final plots, um, you know, for what's been happening during the instrumental period, we would get quite a different picture than if we looked at these time slices further back in time. And so it's really important to understand how the strength and the phasing of these different relationships does vary. So I'm just going to focus on a, on a little example here, and this is the relationship between sea ice extent um, in the Bellingshausen and the Ross Sea and the pressures over the Amundsen Sea. So this um, Amundsen Sea low feature that we see in the, in the top plot here as the, um, as the green for a, a deepening of, of the pressure in that region. And what we also see is that we've got a decline in sea ice in the Bellingshausen Sea. So this is the red area in the bottom plot and, a, and an increase or an expanse of sea ice in the Ross Sea. And so this is again some work that's been kind of looked into investigating using the instrumental data to see how this changing in circulation is both um, dynamically and th you know, thermodynamically um, linked to these two processes. But what I think is quite interesting and quite significant here is that this shift to these deeper, low, um, deeper pressures in the Amundsen Sea seems to be very much limited to this last 50 year time slice. And in fact, if we look at the three time slices before, we've got a shift to more positive, you know, more positive trends. And in fact, the, the, the pattern, if you like, in the first 50 years of the 19th century is almost opposite to what we're seeing now. But what's interesting is that actually, if you look at the sea ice plots in the bottom, they don't follow the same pattern. So what we can see of this, um, this red area where we've got a decrease in sea ice during the recent period that's very strong decrease, we've actually got this decrease in the previous time slices as well. So this appears to be part of a longer trend, which doesn't seem to be linked through those time periods to the changes in pressure. So this is just sort of one example of some of the information that we can start to pull out. But there's interesting things in here. So it's how, the, how these processes vary through time and also kind of making it very clear that the observational period is quite unusual and potentially not the best baseline for our future predictions. So just sort of another way of looking at this, this is again showing the geopotential heights and just showing the, the differences between the, the beginning of the 19th and the end of the 20th century. So again, this sort of pulls out this, this big deepening of the Amundsen Sea low. And for lots of us, obviously, this is a very familiar pattern. This is the, the imprint really of the Southern Annular Mode on here. But for me, some of the things that I find quite interesting and maybe a little bit alarming, if I'm going to be honest, is this evidence of this kind of shift in the circulation patterns has a huge implications for how I and others use our data and ice cores to reconstruct these changes. So if, for example, there's been a big shift, that will have a big impact on the source regions of the proxies that we're looking at. And I'm just going to put up a, a, this schematic here, which is very busy, and it's, it's just sort of intended to, to, in some ways, give you an overview of just how busy and chaotic the system is. But just as an example to show you how changes in circulation, so these wind patterns, are so important. So this is sort of summarizing some of the breadth of different proxies that we've got that come from the ocean and that come from the atmosphere and come from long range sources. So our ice core site is sat there in the middle and all these different things are, are sort of feeding into it. So I don't really wanna go into all of the details, but there is some things that we do make, some assumptions is, is when we're looking at the ice cores. And that is that we know that we understand the source regions of the proxies that are reaching the site and the transport pathways. Whereas if these things have varied through time, then that sort of leads questions as to how suitable or how reliable some of these ice cores may be for reconstructing over longer time periods. So one way of um, addressing this is not only to look at just proxies for sea ice on their own, but actually looking for at the same time proxies for changes in wind. So hopefully we can then start to, to um, look at these things together and yeah, pull them apart a little bit. So this is kind of coming to the final part, really, which is just an introduction to um, a project that I've been involved in now, which is um, part of the Clivash 2K data compilation. So this is the, the salty snow part of this. And so the aim of this um, project, it was a data compilation where we, we put out a call to the community um, to try and establish um, and try and collect as many records of Antarctic um, chemistry from ice cores as possible. So as I showed you earlier, there was only 17 ice core records that have been used for sea ice reconstructions. Well, clearly on this map, and as I, we know from other, other things, there's a whole lot more ice cores. There's hundreds of ice cores from Antarctica. But lots of the data just either isn't published or it's not used because it doesn't, hasn't been seen to have a, a value in terms of reconstructing sea ice on its own. But what we want to do is sort of pull all of that data together 
so that we can start to do more of the work that we've shown with this data assimilation and actually using this data in, in potentially better ways and actually getting a lot more information from it. So the two things that we're focusing on, rather than focusing on everything, is two commonly measured compounds, so sodium and sulfate. And these um, are measured routinely in ice core labs across, across the world, um, and they're relatively easy to collect and methods that are relatively well understood. Um, they're fundamental in how we derive an age scale, for example. So looking at sulfate peaks might be our, our volcanic horizon. So, so it's data that people have readily available. And actually the community responded really well to our call. And we've actually got 111 um, ice core records submitted. And these cover um, most of the, the last 2000 years, although predominantly in the last few hundred years. So I'm just going to quickly return to this, this plot again, this, um, this figure to show you really, for those who are not familiar, actually where sodium and sulfate come from. So um, sodium and sulfate can come from a range of different sources from the open ocean, from just sort of bubble bursting and uplifted off the, off the ocean, so from, from the um, seawater itself. Um, they can also come from the sea ice, so from um, blowing snow or salty snow on top of sea ice. And in the case um, of the sulfate, there's also links there with the biogenic activity. So this is a tracer for, um, for some of the um, biological production that's happening in the oceans, which is in itself dependent or very closely related to changes in sea ice and ice cover and the availability of nutrients. So these are kind of how these two things fit in. And what we're looking at really is that, that both of them are going to be dependent on changes in sea ice to some extent, but also changes in circulation and atmospheric circulation. So hopefully we can, we can look at the two together. Um, and so this is just the, the final bit really to show you is that what we've done now with all of these different records that have been submitted, we're preparing them to go to the data center and have got a, a, an accompanying data paper, which we're hoping to submit later this month. Um, but what we've done is an initial review of all the data we've got so far. So this is just an example plot here. So Daniel Emanuelson's helped with um, producing these figures where each of the records, we've compared them with um, the parameters in the era five reanalysis data. So we're looking at changes in how this compares with the sea ice. So this is shown as the different shading areas, how this compares with the winds. So we combined the 10 meter um, zonal and meridional winds shown here as, as the, the um, arrows, and then also how they compare with atmospheric circulation. And this is the, um, the contours that you can see. So this is just one example from one ice core, the Freenio ice core, which shows that um, the sodium from this site is strongly correlated with sea ice, but it's also strongly correlated with this pattern of circulation. So with the, the blue contours being the Amundsen Sea Low and the, and the arrows showing here the sort of onshore um, movement of the wind. So this is just an, an example really, but we've done this for each of the sites so that then we can put a first order filter in so that of these 111 records that we have, researchers can actually very easily then filter through as an initial look and, and identify and pull out the ones that are particularly relevant for sea ice or winds or, or both. So this is kind of where we've got to with that and hopefully um, that will become available in the next few months. So that was kind of a, a summary of some of the things that I've been working on and some of the things that I'm yeah, hoping to, to complete. Um, but just in summary, so kind of um, recapping again about the importance of snowfall um, and you know how this has a, a mitigating effect on global mean sea levels um, and why then it's important that we look at the drivers of variability. So understanding this background increase, you know, what's driving that, the changes in temperatures, but also looking more at what's happening spatially. So, so looking at the, um, the regional variability and start to try and understand how this is linked to changes in atmospheric circulation and sea ice, and then the larger scale modes of variability on top of those. Um, and just really as well, then the next thing was highlighting and, and kind of demonstrating how valuable a tool this data assimilation approach has been in combining the um, paleo observations with the, the um, data that we get from the global circulation models. And, and I think this has been a, a fantastic um, use of the data and, and something that I'd really like to see a lot more of. And that leads again to this new data compilation, which again is providing um, hopefully the whole community with, with a whole lot more data, which then they can start um, applying these new, new data assimilation approaches or potentially new, um, new methods in machine learning. You know, and it, there's, there's a whole lot more that we can do that I think becomes um, much more likely if we can produce these databases um, and make them readily available. Okay, and with that, I'm gonna finish. Thank you.
very much, Liz, for a, a clear and interesting talk. That was um, excellent. So uh, we have now, now have time for some questions. There's a few people here, so I think the best approach would be for people to put their hands up. You can see a hand up already, and then I'll just take you and um, take questions in turn. And if there's time, I might ask a couple of questions, or if not, I'll ask them a bit, a bit later. But thank you very much, Liz. And I can already see one hand up from uh, while you're so. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Liz, uh, thank you very much for this very exciting and interesting talk. So uh, as a high score uh, person means from the same community. So now we have uh, so much of high score data, so much of reconstruction based on various proxy. But the new trend is now uh, the data assimilation, compilation of multiple uh, proxy and their reconstruction. But in this exercise, what I realized there are two, uh, means, uh, two serious actually thing that we should as a community probably think of. One is actually synchronization of the records. So, so if you do that, then, the, then the, the chronology of individual core and then um, I don't know. So when I, I did some of the exercise based on um, uh, oxygen isotope record. I faced serious problem with the synchronization because uh, many records they have a different uh, means. If you uh, see the chronology is it's not really uh, consistent in many of the cases, and then we face difficulty in synchronizing those records. So this is number one. Number two. Uh, in your CI reconstruction, you have used multiple records, diatoms, MSA, sea salt, sodium, and many other things. So, and then individual proxy has a, a different sensitivity. So if you use uh, one proxy, that will be definitely different from the other uh, proxy in terms of their sensitivity. So should we go for the uh, single proxy, which is, let's say, more common and reasonably sensitive and then get the signal from the I mean, CIs, let's say, or should we go for whatever the reconstruction based on multiple proxy and then compile them? So which will be the better? Uh, so as I, let's say, uh, MSA, MSA relatively less uh, number of records are fine. Whereas in case of, let's say, CSOR sodium is more commonly uh, you will find in the literature. And relatively, so what should be the choice? Should be the choice between the reasonably good sensitive and um, and uh, and available, or let's say we should go for all the reconstruction based on the multiple records. If we go for let's say CIs uh, re, uh, reconstruction and their compilation. Yeah, and um, I think the answer to that is both. Um, and and you've partly kind of in your question sort of answered the way that we did this. So when we looked at it, we can say there's clearly loads of different um, proxies of sea ice and there's new ones coming out and, uh, you know, there's a huge amount of information, but you're right, they're telling us slightly different things. So um, I think there's there's two different things and I think it's really important that, you know, on, on individual sites, we should kind of bring together all the different proxies to try and understand what's going on. But in terms of looking at a, at a bigger, more cohesive sort of spatial pattern, that's just beyond our scope at the moment. There's just no way that we have, um, you know, that much data available that we could do it. So that's why we decided to focus on just the, the, the relatively simple, I, I shouldn't really use that because they're not simple at all, but just focus on the routine ones in the sodium. So that was kind of how we're doing. Um, but in the hope that, you know, maybe in five, five or 10 years time, we'll be back here again and showing that actually we've built on this um, database so much that we've compiled all of the other information as well. And we have the luxury of then deciding which one is best. But so there's sort of two different things. I'll go back to your first question, question which is about the synchronization. You're right, that's absolutely key. And that's a really difficult thing when you start comparing records as you need to know that they're on the same age scale. And so with this data compilation, um, we had Michael Siegel come in as, and, and go through all the different records. So all of the longer records, the ones that span the 2000 years, they're all synchronized to the um, waste divide age scale. So they're all on the same age scale. So there isn't any of those kind of issues between. 
On the shorter records, the shorter timescales, and particularly when we're comparing them with the instrumental data, we have relied on the age scale that's been provided by the, the people who've submitted the data because for most of the sites, they're coastal, they're very high snow accumulation, they've been dated by annual layer counting. So the error will be in the order of, you know, plus or minus a year. So I, I, I kind of see the importance, but there is going to be a little bit of that gray area in between those records in the few hundred years where the dating error may, may increase to, you know, five or 10 years, but they haven't all been synchronized. So yeah, absolutely. It's really important. And it's something that we're kind of working on to the best of, yeah, working with the best we've got really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, a question from Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Uh, thank you, and thanks for that. This is really kind of you to mention my work. Uh, I, I'm <laughs> intrigued by this. Um, <laughs> yeah, this this the decline in the Bellingshausen Sea that ice cores uh, show persisted throughout the 20th century is something that's a little bit different than my reconstructions were showing. And I, it, from what I've read, it, it seems like it's decoupled from the atmospheric circulation, at least the Amazon Sea yes. low. And I was I was wondering if you could, if you have any ideas of what kind of physical mechanism might decouple the sea ice changes in the ice cores from the atmospheric circulation in the, um, like before the satellite era? Yeah, I don't know. I'm guessing whether this is um, an indication of a sort of oceanic influence here that we've got this sort of underlying um, warming, SST warming or something that, that's kind of resulted in this decline. Um, but certainly the, the, the kind of, obviously it becomes strong, the, the, this um, decline becomes much stronger during the latter part of the 20th century when the Amundsen sea low clearly starts to, to really um, get in there. But, but something was happening before, which is more of a, I would imagine, maybe more of a temperature signal. Um, but this is also something that could be quite interesting, whether that's linked to the sort of tropical teleconnections, you know, what that's, that's kind of always where we need to then zoom back out again and start going, okay, what was happening in the tropics? You know, we know there's a the connection with tropical SSTs, were they starting to increase? I think I'm right in saying that the coral reconstruction suggests that that's more of a, a a 100 year trend as well. So, so that's kind of my feeling that that background bit is maybe ocean, oceanic rather than atmospheric. Great, thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Ryan. And Irina, you have a question? Yeah, thank you for this wonderful talk, Liz. That's really interesting. And um, yeah, there was lots of information, but I was um, focusing on the Antarctic Peninsula on your map where uh, you were showing the, the ice cores. And it was really uh, striking that there was only one ice core. Is, uh, um, I mean, is there a reason that you're using only one ice core that really no others are available? Because I think in your earlier studies, you were using more. Yeah, if you can, uh, comment on this, <laughs> yeah, as you know, like the really um, yeah. yeah, it's like on the snowfall, like on the sea ice at this area. So, yeah, yeah. And what can be I done? can, yeah, yeah I can kind of comment on that. Um, you're right. So, in the sea with the with the sea ice, the data that's been submitted for for the Clivash compilation, we could only get data that was either at a data center or that the authors or the PIs were willing to send us. So, there is data that's out there that not everybody wanted to send us. Um, which is unfortunate because it does highlight some areas where we know there is data, um, but people didn't want to share it. Um, for the peninsula, we have a few records, but actually they're relatively short. And that's one of the, um, you know, as someone who works in the peninsula, one of the, the, the great things about all of that snowfall is you get really nice high, high accumulation, um, high resolution records. Uh, the downside is that they're pretty short. So most of the records that are drilled in there, I think, you know, six of the, the dots are my dots. Um, but they only go back the last few hundred years, so then we're quite limited. But you're right, there are longer records in there, but it would be great if people did want to submit. Maybe they will once the first version comes out and they see that they're missing out. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Irina. And we have another question from Siobhan Johnson. Um, hi, Liz. Hi, <laughs> nice <Siobhan. to> <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I was just wondering, obviously, there's a lot of things from uh, my knowledge of sea ice that, um, but I was wondering, um, is the, your resolution of your um, reconstructions, is it like generally on a 50 year basis? Or is it more like 10 year, like, 
are your or does it only go back to 1800s or does it go much further what's your kind of like time scale so the ice core data that's included in those data assimilations um, and all the ice core data that's been submitted to the Clivash database they're all on annual time scales although many okay. of them have high they do have high resolution and they've got seasonal records available but we've just stuck with the annual um, and in the data assimilation it's, it's based on the annual data but it was just selected for that figure to look at oh, okay. the of trends really to sort of try and pull everything out and make it clearer so yeah it's all available annual or higher resolution. Mm, yeah and then um your your work going forward is hoping to increase that resolution further back as well yeah so that's the intention is that we're trying to look at um some of these yeah if we can put in more data then hopefully we could look over um longer time scales um i guess one of the issues potentially with using them then relying on the models is how reliable are they further mm. back in time so i think with some of the historical reconstructions sort of 1800 1850s we're fairly confident with them but but i suppose when you take the models back further in time maybe they they themselves become um uh, yeah a, a little less um reliable and um, yeah so so there will be a few limitations but one of the major ones for us at the moment is that actually we don't have that many long records so for example yeah. i think we've only got 13 in the, the Clivash database that, that span the full 2,000 years. Okay, yeah, because I, I was thinking that, as Ryan was saying, with the oceanic, um, your, um, the geopotential low over the Atmosphere Sea, and that's, you were saying, an oceanic thing rather than an atmospheric thing. What is the influence of, um, maybe there's something different about the sea ice, maybe it's not multi-year sea ice as yeah. we know it to be or something like that. Um, I think that's really, I, yeah. yeah, I think that's really important actually, it's that kind of differences in time scales, because mm -hmm. a lot of what we do, especially with very much within this group, sort of focusing on the on the modern period, is you, you know, it's great that you can get down and look at the real process based on the interseasonal or interannual scale, but actually there's also this kind of underlying um, larger scale variability, this kind of more and centennial scale variability on top of that, and that's mm -hmm. what you can only achieve from the kind of paleo records. And particularly, I think what's really interesting, and again, something we're lacking is, and um, we, we've tried to do is, is really combining what we've got from the ice cores, which is telling you more about the atmosphere and indirectly what's happening in the ocean, and directly working with the, the marine records as well, and yeah. sort of comparing the two. Unfortunately for Antarctica, as everyone knows, we just haven't got enough records, but um, you know, we can we can use studies like this to potentially target where the best places would be. You know, if resources are tight, we can't go everywhere. But maybe we should should look at the records that we have and try and identify actually where would be the best region to compare marine and ice cores, or where would be you know the most the most interesting or the most um, representative region that we should go to. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. And um, I think we should probably. Um, close there and any other questions we can follow up um, after the meeting. So thanks everyone for coming and uh, thanks again Liz for giving a talk. And those of you who are in the steering committee, um, if you want to hang on at the end of this meeting, we'll carry on for a short steering committee meeting um, and the rest of you can, can uh, go off and and do some other things. <laughs> so thanks everyone for coming and um, thanks again, Liz. Thanks Liz. Hello everyone. So we'll have Estelle here. I don't suppose you want to join in with the steering committee meeting, Estelle. <laughs> Are you there? If you're not there, I can uh, I can remove you from the meeting. Okay, I'll go ahead. I'll go ahead and do that. There we go. You are still recording, by the way, Tom, as well. Ah, yes. I will end the recording. Thanks very much, Liz. <laughs>